evening. This is Eyewitness Video, and I'm Patrick Van Horn. People may debate if video has truly changed the world, but there is little doubt that its impact on viewers can be profound. It can move people's emotions and move them to action. It can also move them to completely change the way they live their lives. Tonight, video that has transformed men and women in a remarkable variety of ways. An astonishing filmed record of a quest for freedom. And here was truly a drama of the human spirit, and we were there as it unfolded. A camcorder catches and converts illegal game poachers. They were just shooting, and the geese were falling. And after it was done, there were just geese all over the field. Ride along with a man who chases storms for a living. If you're pursuing something that could turn around in an instant and kill you, you have to be very careful. Also, the incredible tape of a helicopter crash. I just had the feeling that uh, this was it, that we, uh, we were not going to live through this. But we begin with video that lets you ride Niagara Falls. I looked at the situation and said, that's impossible. No one can go down there. These guys were about to risk their lives to capture this camera. Metavision is a California company that, among other things, creates thrill rides. Motion-based rides that marry movement with stunning video. Riders have the illusion of danger, but sit in complete safety. September 1990, Niagara Falls. Metavision is here to shoot video for an attraction called Ride Niagara. But once shooting begins, the producers experience some thrills of their own. Vehicle control launch unit G. Roger. Confirming tunnel speed. Arriving at Upper River Tunnel Shaft. Prepare to flood hydro tunnel. Valve open. Vehicle away. Exiting lock the river. Exit confirmed. Unit G is in Upper River. All systems go. Looks good. Unit G on auto control. In creating this attraction, what we kind of hoped was that people would have the experience of going over Niagara Falls, but not really be drawn to the danger of actually trying it. This was one of the most challenging projects that we ever worked on because the look that we were trying to get was not a computer image or a pretend image, but an actual look at being on the top of the falls and actually going over the falls. So in order to do that, we literally had to send cameras over the falls. All right, put that down. So camera three, running, running. As a director, one would like to be able to predict everything. Uh, when you're going into a situation like throwing cameras over Niagara Falls, you can't. Well, we came up with the idea to use beer kegs because they were intrinsically very strong. They floated by themselves and were watertight. The real challenge came on the third launch of our cameras over the falls. The camera went right over the edge. It was beautiful. Our spotters were there, and it disappeared. No one could find it. And the force of the water caught it just right and spat it out from behind the falls to just in front of the falls. It became apparent to us at that point that there was no way that it was going to go further downriver. Now it's sitting there in front of the falls with the world's fiercest hurricane times 10 coming down on it continuously. The question was, can we even begin to think about getting it out of there? David Hill and Peter Crimes, our key grip, went down on a line to actually try to retrieve the camera. We needed two guys to go in and under the falls to get the camera out. 
I realized we couldn't pull the barrel out of there. It was too heavy, too dangerous, and we would have been putting ourselves in a very, very dangerous situation. I can't begin to describe to you the nervousness that I had in my stomach because these guys were going to a place probably where no one has ever gone before. And the only guy who really knew where all the bolts were was me. <laughs> so down we went. The water's hitting the rocks at the base of the falls and shooting straight out at you incredibly fast. So what I did, I turned my back into the falls and tried to shield Peter from the water as much as possible. Okay, Davey, we're out of here. My whole back was black and blue just from the water hitting us. And I'm sure that Peter was in the same sort of shape because we, we took quite a beating. After we retrieved the camera, the real concern was whether or not we had the shot. When we looked at the footage, we said, hey, ooh, special event. Ooh, you folks seem to be caught behind the falls. We'll use this and write it into the show. In the finished ride, it worked very well. Vehicle control imaging is behind the fall. Please release auto control. We have control. Where are you, G? Ladies and gentlemen, this is Captain Doug from Master Control. You need to be caught behind the fall. We'll have you out of there in just a minute. Thank you. We've cleared the falls. Roger. Submerge and proceed to rendezvous. Unit G telemetry seems to be breaking up. We have tether lock. Okay, take her up. Ground crew, come in. Yeah, this because is it was all video, lots of people clear. would be able to go okay, over Niagara Falls in a high-tech barrel in perfect comfort and yeah, relative this safety. Is ground crew, unit G clear. Hey, what happened? It looked kind of banged up. Hey, I don't know. Breaker. When eyewitness video returns, one man's love affair with storms. We'll be back after these messages. It is dangerous. Uh, it can be exciting and it's quite challenging. But I am a photojournalist, and this is what I do for a living. Our next story is about one man's passion for the power and beauty of storms, the motivating force in the life and career of Warren Fadley. Starting out as a still photographer, he soon realized that a single picture could not capture the danger and excitement of actually pursuing a storm. And so he turned to video, and his videos take us from one terrifying storm to another. We have emergency units rolling directly in front of my vehicle now. Tornado still on the ground over there behind the rain. Possible tornado on the ground behind the chase vehicle. Extreme wind. That's circulation on the ground. Got to get out of the way. You're pursuing something that could turn around in an instant and kill you. You have to be very careful. Tornado directly above the car. I don't know if the guy down the road sees it or not. It is directly overhead. You had a final cloud right above you. You had a pretty good final cloud right above you. It came right out of there. It was right above the car. Oh, well, I think I'm going to go back the other way for a while because that thing's still spinning around. Very serious. Man, it's very lucky. It can be a battle, it can be a war, but you have to get close enough to get the shot you're looking for. that this is a potentially dangerous weather situation for much of Oklahoma. Extreme instability. It has been called the ultimate big game hunt, and when you think about it, that's really what it is. Lightning, did you see that? As far as I know, I'm the only journalist in the world that chases storms on a full-time basis. I chase over 100 storms a year, and I chase throughout the United States and into Mexico. Of all the tornadoes I've ever captured on video, this is probably the most impressive one because I was able to get so close to it. At one point, 
uh, lightning bolt came right out of the funnel. I was born in Topeka, Kansas during the height of the tornado season. And then my father was transferred to Mobile, Alabama, which is a hurricane hotbed. So at a very early age, I was subjected to almost all forms of severe weather, which probably sparked my curiosity. very dangerous at night when there's any report of a tornado. It's almost impossible to see them unless they're illuminated by lightning. The hail and the lightning this night was incredible. Storm chasing is an all-consuming profession. You basically have to work 24 hours a day. I keep a video camera in a very heavy duty metal box because it's always being knocked around. As a rule of thumb, I like to have everything packed up and ready to go so I can be out of here in five minutes. One of the great additions to my chase arsenal is the new portable fax machine. And with this unit, I can access weather data, including satellite images or even radar, instant radar reports, from almost any location in the world, as long as I have a phone hookup to it. And that can be a, a pay phone in some small little town, or it can even be the uh, cellular phone that I carry around with me. away now a very 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 large vortex I'd never seen a tornado that big and it didn't look real it looked like a like smoke rising from a large fire okay it's gonna be crossing the road now the closer I got to it the more I realized that it was just a monster sized tornado very large tornado unfortunately appears to be going through a populated area now we got to stop here pretty soon. We do have debris falling in the area. I don't think most people understand the true destructive force of a tornado. In 1987, I was in Saragossa, Texas, just a couple hours after a killer tornado went through and destroyed almost the entire town. saw some amazing things. Sections of pavement had been lifted up and carried away by the tornado. Cars had been pelted by rocks that looked like a machine gun had hit them. I even found a fork embedded in a tree and bent over. As a storm chaser, that was a very humbling storm because for the first time I, I was able to see personally the damage and destruction that a tornado can bring. I think if I was married and had a family, it would be virtually impossible and probably wouldn't be proper for me to be out taking the, the risks that I do. This is a very dangerous area. I want to watch what I'm doing here. I feel that I'll be chasing storms until I'm either too old to drive or too old to see. As long as I'm physically able to, I'm going to be pursuing it. I have another tornado forming heading uh, right my direction. Coming up, surveillance in the war on poaching. And then, the remarkable film diary of a struggle for freedom. Eyewitness video will be right back. Most hunters abide by the regulations that limit the amount of game they kill, but some don't. They're poachers, and someone is out to stop them. His name is Dave Hall. In 30 years with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, it's been his mission to transform convicted poachers into advocates for sensible game management. Dave's weapon in this crusade is a video camera, which he first began using in undercover sting operations.
In duck hunting, we have a, a very scientific system of establishing limits and seasons. And if the laws are obeyed, it's a very effective system. But if you have people out here that disobey the laws, the wildlife can't survive. So I came up with an idea that I would use the video camera as part of my cover working on sting operations. And I had heard about the Trumps, these two Cajun fellows. We are down. I used to go. We're still there, man. Legal goose hunters were infuriated by them going all over the rice country over there on private land or anywhere and shooting these geese. Whatever you're ready. And I knew where their territory was, so I went out there that morning with one of the special agents that had been assigned to go work with me. You didn't see any game wardens, did you? I hope not. I wouldn't know what they looked like, though. He told the hunters that we were wildlife writers, and they uh, were kind of thrilled about the fact that we wanted to do a story on them. And uh, they said, sure, come on. Come with us. You might put you on national television. Last <laughs> year, right there along the road, they must have killed about a hundred of them of geese. And they began to tell us they killed pickup truckloads of geese. And I said, oh, it's hard to believe. Well, they invited us to go with them. I'll bet you one shot now. I'll bet you I can knock down at least 50 of them. Yeah. We followed the hunters to the field, and there were thousands of geese. They were crawling along the levee so that the geese wouldn't see them. Then all of a sudden, on a signal, they all jumped up and just started shooting into the flock. They were just shooting, and the geese were falling. And after it was done, there were just geese all over the field. Some of the geese, they were crippled, and they would go out there and grab them up and wring their necks. That looked like y'all were invading Southeast Asia or something over there. And they were all laughing and thought it was a lot of fun. And Dave just kept filming. Well, you packing a load there, son. You packing a load there. It was the first time I'd ever seen something like this and, and the slaughter of how many geese that they took and how they didn't even care. Go ahead, I'll kill him. And they all went in there and collected the geese up and took them out and loaded it into a pickup truck. You guys are good at estimating. How many is it? About 120, 150. And the pickup truck was filled up to capacity. I got the going to work. We followed them back into their warehouse where they took the geese out. 20, 25, 30, 55, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 25, 30, 35, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, they were taken during that goose creep or blue and snow geese, and the limit was five per person per day. One of them looked at me and he said, I hope you're not a federal game warden. And I said, well, brother, if I am, you're in a hell of a lot of trouble. I didn't say no, and I didn't say yes. I was thinking, your day's coming. And it did. They got penalized severely, and they went to jail. So I just decided to do a little video that could educate poachers. The creeper sport is a competition to see who can kill the most. And hopefully this video would someday 
be able to prevent these activities and the crippling particularly in the slaughter. And it worked, it worked, there's no question about it. Because other poachers, most of them when they see the video, the first thing they do is relate to those guys. That's what woke me up, that goose creek. Looking at that first videotape, it shot me into reality. And I thought, I'm no different than this guy that's fixing to go to jail. And the bunch of people I ran with, it was, you know, kill them when you could, kill as many as they were, you know, and don't worry about tomorrow. And it was a socially accepted thing to, to shoot over the limit or to shoot out of season. Everybody else was doing it. It was like, you know, well, so-and-so does it, why can't I? Most of these people were heroes in their communities. They weren't looked down upon by society as, as, as evil people. And I was thinking, if you could convert them and put it on video to educate others about the importance of wildlife laws, then you would have an effective program. And that was what I wanted to do with the video camera, was to make my program that's now been called Poachers to Preachers. That's what made me want to jump up and holler, Hallelujah, Dave, I have sinned, you know, Listen to me. I finally got caught, and uh, that was probably the worst day of my life as far as, uh, you know, having to deal with something that I brought on myself. These people are real people that are just telling their story, and they're being very honest about it, and that's how you change attitudes. I rode all the way home feeling like I was either going to throw up or mess in my britches. And, you know, I was real hesitant to do it, but I wanted to do it for my kids because I thought, well, this is a way that I can put something back that I've taken out. How old are you boys now? I'm four. You're Six four? He's, he's six. Teaching these kids to violate would be like teaching them to go rob a 7-Eleven, I guess. It's just the same difference. How did you get started? You know, why did you do it? Uh, how do you feel about this? All the questions that we need to know to have an effective law enforcement program, I was able to ask them on camera. Well, this is a tradition. Yeah. Killing ducks in South Louisiana. It's a family tradition. This thing's been handed down from his dad to him, from, from his dad's dad to his daddy, from my grandpa to my dad, and he handed it down to me, and it stopped right here. Because my son isn't going to be an outlaw. Dennis Treitler was a bad violator. After his friends had been caught and they went to jail, I sensed that Dennis was ready to join the right team. And he agreed to do a video with me. I really never was a hunter in the sense that people enjoy hunting. I was, I was more of a killer. Bom, 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 bom. As fast as you can load up till you run out of shells or your shoulder couldn't take it no more and that's how we used to shoot. We had been seeing the decline in these ducks for years. And all, here comes Dave, puts a video in, stick it in a VCR, whoppo, outlaws on television. He said, do you know that you guys are destroying the things that you love to do so much? And I wanted to start helping. And now, it's like, it's like a religion now. And that's what we've been doing, just preaching. You know, and you guys are directly and indirectly involved with it too. Dennis started teaching in the schools down there where most of the people live off the land. They're trappers and fishermen and crabbers and oystermen. And they truly still live that way. He is the come. You all are going to be part of the solution. And it Education is really going to be the key to solving this problem. The point gets across more than anybody else because we're speaking from the heart. That's the greatest reward you can have in law enforcement where you see one of the worst violators, not only not violating, but on the other side being effective in educating others why these laws are important and, and that game wardens are really not their enemy, they're their friend. Sunrise. I could go around speaking to audiences, including fill in the Superdome every day, and I couldn't talk to enough people in my lifetime to make a real difference. Oh, 
The video camera is the only way today that you can effectively change attitudes and educate people. How many does can we shoot? 15. 15. Uh -huh. But it goes further than that. In courts where we're working cooperatively with them, part of the sentencing with serious violators is that they go on camera, tell their story. I can change, but uh, my peers, not all of them are going to change. And, you know, they're going to go with their dying day, you know, try and kill the last duck in the country. From that, then, we can edit another video, and all the people convicted of a wildlife violation have to return to the courtroom in a predetermined date and watch the videos. And it works. We've been able to improve our compliance levels to waterfowl regulations in the state of Louisiana in the past five years well beyond anybody's expectations, including my own. This is my life out here. And I want to help it get better. And I'm going to do whatever it takes to do it. It's just that simple. Dave Hall's efforts converting poachers to preachers has paid off. The converts' lobbying has been instrumental in helping the Fish and Wildlife Service raise money to buy a new helicopter, which in turn has aided in the capture of more poachers. Coming up, digging a tunnel to freedom beneath the Berlin Wall. And you'll witness the drama surrounding a family tragedy. Eyewitness Video returns after these messages. Today, in the high-tech world of TV news, it is almost commonplace to see extraordinary events like the destruction of the Berlin Wall as they happen. It was not so common 30 years ago when the wall was first built. Film cameras documenting the Cold War usually arrived after events took place. But back then, NBC News produced a dramatic documentary called The Tunnel. In it, cameras rolled as an escape route was dug under the wall. Tonight, meet the people involved in the tunnel and learn what was going on below ground as tensions above nearly boiled over into war. Berlin, and specifically West Berlin, was the most important news center in the entire world, especially for television, because the Cold War, which was the dominating fact of all our lives, was being played out along that border. Around the middle and late 50s, an exodus started from Berlin of people who could not continue to live in a communist state. The doctors, the teachers, the lawyers, the engineers were leaving as fast as they could go, and something had to be done to stop it. And that was building the wall, separating East and West Berlin, so that nobody could go from one end to the other. And the wall went up in August of 61, 1961, and immediately the escapes started, and immediately all the American reporters there started trying to film these escapes. There were people jumping out of windows, people leaping over barbed wire. There were people trying to get out through the sewer system. And then gradually, people started to dig tunnels. And we had permission to film in a tunnel being dug by engineering students who wanted to build something like a major metropolitan subway in there. They really were ambitious. This is the story of those people and that tunnel. Here was truly a drama of the human spirit, and we were there as it unfolded, bit by bit by bit. The leaders were two young Italians who were students at the Technical University. We made it clear to NBC that if too many people knew about it, that would be a catastrophe. But we had to take this risk. After all, if you can't trust NBC, who can you trust? Everything was on a need-to-know basis, and it was really cloak and dagger. On the night of May 9th, 1962, 
a half hour before midnight, the tunnel started. The tunnel ran from a bombed out brick building in West Berlin and into an apartment house on the East German side. It was a terribly dangerous thing. I mean, the East German police were, were really barbaric. I mean, they would shoot anything. In the year following the war, more than 40 died escaping from East Germany. We knew about the risks, and we tried to think of all the details. We were very thorough. There were 20 students digging the tunnel, and they worked in shifts, 24 hours a day. Each one dug for one reason. He was trying to get a brother out, a sister, a wife, a child. Everybody, by digging, got a ticket to get somebody out of East Germany. This digger, Hasso Herschel, was a refugee himself. He was working to rescue his sister. It was my duty to help my friends and my relations. We had no doubt that that just was the right and only thing one could do. Besides the diggers, there was room for the cameraman if he lay on his back and pointed the camera forward. I had just started to uh, do camera work, and this was really a big responsibility put on me. Everybody was afraid. But when you start working, I think you forget. You just go ahead and, and do it. By June 6th, they were digging under the death zone. The work picked up a steady rhythm. It seemed to me very important that we leave the impression of what it was like. And what it was like was hard, monotonous work. Although the young men mechanized their equipment more and more, their basic machine was the human hand. In Laufe der Zeit is the Arbeit etwas. As time went on, work got a little better because we were better equipped. And then we found out that there is no more oxygen in front. And you cannot breathe without fresh air. But it's like you breathe in a bag. And after you did it 20, 40 times, you would get tired and headaches. They bought a compressor install pipes and western air blew under the wall into East Berlin. Finally they filled the whole basement with dirt because they dug so much dirt. The tunnel was now 80 yards long. All of a sudden the water came in and it came from from all over the place. It just dripped down. And we pumped like crazy but it would not go out. Half a pint at a stroke. They pumped 8,000 gallons in one week. The water and the smell, God, the smell down there was just unbelievable, you know, like uh, being in an old swamp or something. We went to the authorities and confided in a high-ranking official. We told them that, that there was a break in the water pipes and they repaired it. The flood stopped. I said, can you take a sound camera down? They said, there's no room. I said, I need some sound. So they got the sound of the tunnel. During the digging, the world outside, the world up top, didn't exist. And the one thing that got through to the diggers was when Peter Fechter, who tried to escape, was shot by the border police and lay dying. Durch den Kopf geht sie. The bullet went like this, through the head. It was perfectly aimed. The great drama of Fechter was that the West Berlin police could not get to him. He gasped out his life in the presence of everybody as though on a stage, and that's what got them. Well, the tunnel finally ended up in a basement of this apartment house in East Berlin. On Thursday, September 13th, they made their last inspection. 
After noon on Friday, Suster's fiance boarded the elevated railway and rode to East Berlin to several rendezvous with refugees. And my job was as courier. My job was to work as a courier. Without thinking, I said, "Sure, I'll do it," as if I were starting a great adventure. You were not allowed to film on that train, so I left the train one station before the border. You had no more contact to her. No one knew what she was running into. You know, I was very much afraid that something may happen to her. There was no time to reflect and, and what can be, what cannot be. It was only this job, do it, and do it perfect. While the evening shift of the Popos guarded the forbidden zone, the breakthrough was being made in the cellar of number seven. And then I got the call. I said, you're sure this isn't a false alarm? He said, no, this is it. You can see the bottom of the shaft and nothing else. And then all of a sudden, a hand comes out. And then a person. And then the person turns around. She was halfway up and the step ladder started to move. I mean, she almost fall off. And of course, I was on the edge on, on the basement, and there was no one else to help, you know. I said, well, give me the light. So Klaus handed over the light to me, and I kept the camera on one hand and the light in the other, and he jumped in to help her up. If that light had fallen, we would have lost the story. And I thought I'd kill him. In that dramatic evening, we filmed 26 people leaving. And 31 came out on Sunday for a total of 59. It was great. It was great. <laughs> it was great. Es war ein eine riesen Sensation. It was a great sensation. It was one of the most beautiful moments of my life. Suddenly, everything I had dreamed of had been realized. Was ich davor auch mal teilweise träumt hatte. Being involved in this kind of news story is something that happens if you're lucky once in your career. You stand by there as a cameraman and you try to film this. It was very, very moving. One of the diggers watched his daughter come through and then his wife. He had escaped from East Germany the year before. His wife had spent 10 months in a communist prison for trying to follow him, and their second child was born in jail. Tonight, for the first time, he held his baby. It's a, a triumphal ending. This is what it was for, and it worked. 59 people came through the tunnel to freedom before floodwaters closed it off. The State Department tried to prevent NBC from airing this documentary, but ironically, after it was broadcast, the government bought hundreds of copies to use as anti-communist propaganda. Next on Eyewitness Video, the incredible tape of a helicopter accident. We'll be right back. In September of 1990, an Oklahoma City police officer was shot and killed in the line of duty. The city's police force and the officer's family were devastated by the death. But during this time of grief and sorrow, a video camera happened to record another brush with tragedy. This story begins with a frantic call over police radio. 
Chief of Police hopes that the thing he'll never have to do is bury one of his officers. But I don't know that I ever went to a funeral or was involved in the death of a police officer that had such a profound effect on me as the one involving this officer, Warren Tooman. He was an exceptional police officer, but beyond that, he was an exceptional person. My brother wanted to be a cop because he knew he could make a contribution to society and make the world a little better place to live. I decided that it was very important, very important for me as the chief of police to go and visit personally with Warren's family, that to make sure that they knew exactly, exactly what had happened to Warren. It was a situation where he couldn't have done anything better to prevent himself from getting shot. It was just uh, one of those occurrences that couldn't be helped as we saw it. The chief volunteered to meet with our family at the family church in Anadarko, Oklahoma. Myself and Chief McBride and the pilot and co-pilot all met at the Oklahoma City Police helicopter pad to fly down to Anadarko. The weather was beautiful. It was uh, clear, sunny. Um, you just couldn't ask for a better day for, for flying. As we arrived there at the church, I noticed that Mike had the camera. And I also noticed that during the briefing inside uh, the church, uh, he had his camera rolling. Uh, not being a camera uh, person myself, I mean, I thought that was a little unusual. I mean, not unusual, but different. I brought along my camera to, so I could record the details of exactly what Chief McBride had explained to the family that followed the death of my brother. So I'll tell you in as much detail as I can, and if I don't give you the level of detail that you want, then you ask me and I'll answer any questions that you have about what happened. He uh, come in, he had a diagram, he showed us what happened, where the killer was, where Warren was. The suspect bolted out, pushed this door open, and the shots were fired in just a matter of probably less than a second. He showed us the rap sheet of this guy. This two, three, four foot long. We just needed to know for our own, our own self what happened. And he was nice enough to come down and explain it to us. Well, I know it's tough for you, but I don't want it to be tough because there's something that we could have told you that you don't know. After Chief McBride had finished talking to the family, I had a few more minutes of battery life left, and I thought I'd photograph my grandson as they showed him the police helicopter. Brandon, what are you doing? You like that? Chief McBride was running short of time, and they had to get back to Oklahoma City. So we got Brandon out of the helicopter, stood back, and watched him take off. We needed some medical people there fast. The family was under a lot of stress, a lot of strain that day, and my God, there's gonna be more of it. It was like an eternity that we, from the time we hit that wire to the time we hit the ground, I thought we would never, never get to the ground. And then when we did, it was just chaos. And I was just too stunned to do anything except keep pressing the red button and hold my eye to the viewfinder. We wanted to get out because it, Every movie that I've ever seen on a helicopter, when it hits, it explodes, and, and that's what I'm thinking, it's gonna blow up. I just had the feeling that uh, this was it, that we, uh, we were not gonna live through this. He got the engine to shut down, we unbuckled the seatbelts, and we were able to then crawl out of the helicopter. I wanted to grab him and hug him, I was so happy for him. It wasn't until uh, after the crash that I learned that the number of people who survived helicopters running into highline wires 
It was pretty slim. Probably truly was a miracle. My Uncle Warren was a very spiritual man. Maybe he was there that day. Warren could have been with us and, and uh, helped us get through the whole incident, myself, the chief, and the whole family. I thought of him a whole lot that evening. I mean, I just, I want to say, I know you're here, Warren. Because of this accident, Oklahoma City Police helicopters are now equipped with an attachment called a wire strike, a device which clips power lines before the rotor blades become entangled. Those are my kids. We'd like to see your video if it's resulted in some kind of a change. Give us a call. Our phone number is 1-800-55-VIDEO. That's 1-800-55-VIDEO. All stories will be verified for authenticity. Coming soon on Eyewitness Video. Get out of here! Witness a drug bust that ends in a shootout. A woman is thrown from a raft into freezing rapids. Also, video as a weapon in the war on drunken driving. And the story of a tropical paradise devastated by Hurricane Iniki. I'm Patrick Van Horn. Thanks for joining us. I'll see you on our next edition of Eyewitness Video. Good night. Next, one of Hollywood's hottest actors, Christian Slater, stars in the network premiere movie Cuffs. And Thursday night, on an all-new crime and punishment, a high school student is killed when an initiation ceremony goes too far. Was it an accident, or did someone order the murder to cover up a secret? Look inside the mind of a cult-like leader on an all-new Crime and Punishment NBC Thursday.